80 years ago, American citizens were rounded up and isolated from the rest of the population and placed in internment camps. Even though they supposedly had the same rights as their compatriots, the non-oriental fabric of society, Americans of Japanese origin found themselves maltreated and isolated from the rest of the world. This event would last for five years and ceased only upon the conclusion of the Second World War. Similar attitudes and behaviors in the United States impacted other cross-sections of society, larger cross-sections, like Americans of African descent, who for decades after World War II struggled for full equality and integration into the American dream. Democracy wasn't for everyone back then. A majority ruled and had all their rights protected and enforced, while a significant minority were systematically discriminated against. In actuality, such democracies weren't really operating as democracies. One such case in today's dynamic is Israel, a nation supposedly a beacon for freedom, equality, liberty, a country promoting Western ideals founded on the protection of basic human rights. Much is made of this democracy and the importance of its defense and sustainability at any cost by Western superpowers, be it against any ideological criticism or physical foe. But there are doubts as to the applicability of the label. Can Israel truly be called a democracy? Whenever Israel is mentioned in the news, two common slogans that always seem to immediately surface on a news host's mind and lips are that Israel has the most moral army in the world and that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Our topic of interest for this video is the latter of the two, Israel the democracy. And why is this topic so important? Well, the slogan, only democracy, carries certain empowering associations. That Israel is a modern and civil nation, with laws and enforcement that are applied to all its citizens in a fair and just manner, across the board. And with the slogan also come the bragging rights that it is morally and ethically on higher ground and superior to the other regional players who are less democratic and in some cases totally autocratic. So it's only right to examine this claim. Democracies are in essence about accountability and hence Israel and its democracy has to be weighed, has to be measured and a conclusion must come as to whether Israel's democracy is found wanting or not. Israel is made up of two main groups, Jewish Israeli citizens, who make up close to 79% of the population, and then Arab Israeli citizens, who prefer to be identified as Palestinian citizens of Israel, making up the remaining 21%. So as an absolute value, this figure, based on the latest census calculations, equals to just over 2 million people. These citizens, who were indigenous to the lands prior to the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, and the ones who remained after the expulsion of many of their relatives and compatriots, were more or less of the same ethnicity, yet belonged to a variety of religions – Muslim, Druze, and Christian. This is Israel's minority, and the group of people that's always referred to by the Zionist narrative as a minority who gained greatly in living within a fair and democratic nation, an example of the successes of nations built on the rule of law, one law for all, without prejudice. And if you look at it from a superficial perspective, your takeaways will be the same. Palestinian citizens of Israel enjoy the benefits of representation, voting, education, and all the other benefits and services democratic nations provide to their people. And for most, that is enough to establish and accept the notion of an absolute equality amongst majorities and minorities. But democracies don't work that way. Democracies are about the nuances that come in the form of detailed legislation that regulates the rights of the people. And when analyzing the laws of Israel and their evolution since its establishment, many academics and thinkers recognize a darker truth, that Israel is not a democracy at all, but an ethnocracy. But when I look at the definition of ethnocracy, I don't think it really fits. Ethnocracy refers to government law and rule for the benefit of one ethnic group over other minorities. That is a difficult claim to make regarding Israel. Its ethnicity is as diverse as can be. So what would be an alternative designation? Obviously, the main unifying factor for Israel's majority is the Jewish faith. So would that make Israel a theocracy? It does make sense. If you look at the Israeli Declaration of Independence and subsequent foundational and legislative documentation of the state, one can extract the many clear references to the primarily Jewishness of the nation and how the faith in toto is prioritized above all others in the established laws and the rights of the people. 
And this is what I want to break down for you. The listing of the detailed laws that reflect the superiority of the Jewish believers of Israel as citizens over that of the multi-faith Palestinian citizens of Israel. The rights of a Jew under this law and the rights of a Jewish immigrant under the Nationality Law 5712-1952, as well as the rights of a Jewish immigrant under any other enactment, are also vested in a child and a grandchild of a Jew, the spouse of a Jew, the spouse of a child of a Jew, and the spouse of a grandchild of a Jew. This early immigration, repatriation, and naturalization of Israeli citizens law allows every Jewish person to immigrate to Israel and automatically become a citizen of the state. The law also applies to the children and grandchildren of Jews, as well as their spouses and the spouses of their immediate families. No comparable law exists to guarantee the rights of relatives of Palestinian citizens of Israel to immigrate or receive citizenship, even if they were born in what is now the state of Israel. The superficial narrative will tell you that on the socio-economic front, Palestinian citizens of Israel are way better off than other Arabs around the region. Well, that could be true, but that's not an applicable comparison. Palestinian citizens must be compared to the remainder of Jewish citizenry in Israel. And when we do that, we start to witness the structural disadvantages Palestinian citizens are victims of. For the Jewish population, 18% are either at the poverty line or below it. Now compare that with the Palestinian citizens of Israel, whose figure stands at over 53%, basically a three times multiple. And when we look at laws like the Economic Efficiency Law of 2009, a law that extends government permission to use sweeping discretion to classify towns, villages, and areas as National Priority Areas (NPAs) and to allocate enormous state resources without criteria, we start to see realized examples of discrimination, allowing for biased government decision-making, such as in 1998, which classified 553 Jewish towns and only four Arab villages as MPAs with A status, consequently providing only those towns and villages with substantial government funding. That's less than 1% funding going to non-Jewish communities. In the educational systems of Israel, history is distorted, promoting the narrative that Palestine, Palestinians, and their identity never existed. Basically, your run-of-the-mill Zionist version of history. And the dilemma facing Palestinians is that the act of recalling the memory and the continuity of their faith, their crises and injustices, are categorized as treachery and subject to the enforcement of criminal laws, even for children. With the amendment of state education law in 2000, a restructuring of the educational principles included the following. To impart the principles of the Declaration of the Independence of the State of Israel and the values of the State of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. To teach the history of the land of Israel and the State of Israel. To teach the principles of Israel, Jewish history, the heritage of Israel and the Jewish tradition and to impart the awareness of the memory of the Holocaust and its heroism. While at the very end of the amendment, one single small point alludes to recognize the language, culture, history, heritage, and unique traditions of the Arab population and other population groups in Israel. Yet the concern and real question is, whose version of culture and history? Defense for Israel is of the most paramount importance, and hence conscription into the military is part and part of the Israeli identity, where both men and women serve without question. But that's not really the case. Historically, there have always been some exemptions to this important element of Israeli citizenship, such as the Haredi Jews exemption, that is recently seeing a revoking of its status. Another main controversial exemption is that of the Palestinian citizens of Israel. All non-Jewish citizens except for Druze males are exempt from military service. Such an exemption has been in place since the establishment of the nation. The question is why? Some say it's for humanitarian reasons when Palestinian Israelis might be required to enter into military engagement against their Palestinian relatives in the occupied territories, a difficult psychological predicament that can present a difficult moral choice. That doesn't seem to make sense to me though. How can the government deem the enforcement of the conscription of the Haredi Jews who are conflicted because of their faith as a natural development of the demands on citizenry, yet not apply that same insensitivity towards the Palestinian Israelis? Something is off here. And the only reason that one can decipher is that there is no trust in those citizens. And again, 
The question is why? Especially if the narrative suggests that they are equal and benefit exactly in the same way as the Jewish majority. One should also know that upon serving in the IDF, many financial benefits are provided to those who have completed their service, including educational assistance and discounted permits for building homes and owning land. Networking that can lead to social and professional advantages for job security. A positive outcome that no Zionist would wish on Palestinian citizens. The bill to amend Basic Law No. 1160 in 2014 raised the threshold percentage of votes required for political parties in order to obtain seats in the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, from 2% to 3.25%. Such an impact immediately crippled the Palestinian citizens of Israel's representation and hence disenfranchised them. Such a threshold would negate many if not all the existing Palestinian Israeli political parties who typically gained between 2 to 3% of the vote and would hence gain a further reduced presence in the Knesset. In addition to this law, the Israeli voting system strategically limits the overall number of non-Jewish voter turnout by creating significant logistical obstacles such as extremely distant voting stations for the 250,000 strong Bedouin tribes of the Negev regions, at times at over 50 kilometers away. Usually a nation would have a law passed and then would expect the masses and their behavior to condition themselves in implementing that law. But with Israel, it was the actions and intentions of the Zionist nation that were established first. Its inequality, its injustices, its unfairness that was then shaped into a new proposed law reflecting the discrimination and suppression of the original status quo. With this strategy came the basic law, Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people in 2018, that fully officialized that Israel was a Jewish nation above all else. All iterations of citizenry, including immigration, language, observing religious holidays, biblical history of the promised land and chosen people, self-determination, were all referenced not to all the population of Israel, but codified strictly to the Jewish people of Israel. There are over 65 laws that discriminate against the Palestinian citizens of Israel. I've put a link to a site called adala.org that lists all these laws and their detrimental impact on the minority laws in their truest manifestations and applications that establish the dominance of the citizens of the Jewish faith above everyone else. Laws that were written with an intentional vagueness, thereby allowing for the exclusion and suppression of a substantial minority, to keep them on the lowest rungs of society, while allowing for a few token success stories here and there, to flaunt around for the West so that Israel is indeed portrayed and projected as fair, equal and just in their citizenry and in their democracy. The same way the world woke up to the deception and injustices of Zionism and how it has dealt with the Palestinian struggle historically, in Gaza and the West Bank, the world will also soon wake up to the discrimination it enforces on its less equal citizens, those of Palestinian origins. Injustice has a way of revealing itself, against those who attempt to disguise the truth. The question is not how, but when.